about the music? Yeah. <laughs> Did you pick the music, Chris? It's, uh, it's, <laughs> it's getting better and better. <laughs> okay, good afternoon, everyone. We, uh, we have a great panel, so we'll jump in uh, right away. Uh, I'll make some brief introduction uh, quickly. Pablo Cagnoni, right to my left, CEO of Rubius. Uh, Pablo has led several biotech companies, and he, he was leading uh, clinical development and the Varis in, uh, in his past. Uh, Christian Hege, who is uh, Senior Vice President of Early Clinical Development in Hematology, Oncology, and Cell Therapy. I did it at BMS. Uh, she's still practicing medicine one day a week. Uh, bravo, congratulations, bravo. Andy Plump, who doesn't really need any uh, introduction, who is, of course, President and uh, Global Head of R&D at uh, Takeda, and, and before that, Senior Leadership Position at Merck and Sanofi, where we met, I think. And uh, last but not least, Catherine Simon Bream, who is the uh, CEO of, uh, oh, how am I thinking? Chroma <laughs> Therapeutics, which is one of our companies, sorry. <laughs> and before that, she has senior position at Amgen and Regeneron. So um, I'll go in order here. I'll start with you, Pablo. We're, we're going to start with just mapping a little bit the, uh, the space in GCT. And, uh, and I'll ask each of you to just go over it and tell us what, uh, what's most interesting to you right now. How do you look at the space? How do you map? Uh, the different modality. Obviously, we're going to go more in depth in terms of where they are in terms of stage of de development, approvability, what are some of the challenges that remain for some of those. Obviously, for you, Andy, and Kristen, we're going to ask a little bit about portfolio strategy and how you're looking at those. I'm sure you're not going to share everything, but if you give us a little, little bit of your thinking, that'd be great. Uh, and then once we've done that initial mapping, we're going to go more in depth. So. Pablo, uh, how do you look at that space? What do you like? What do you like maybe not as much? What do you see as more challenging? What do you see as more short term? Uh, take it away. OK. Uh, thank you, Jeff. Thank you for inviting me. It's, uh, it's wonderful to be here with this terrific panel. So I was, <clears throat> I was thinking when I was coming, I, you know, you and I spoke the other day, but I was thinking when I was coming over that uh, in August is going to be 10 years. Since we did, I was at Novartis at the time, and we did the deal for uh, CAR T cell therapy, which really brought CAR T cells into the biopharma industrial age. Really, it was the first deal. Juno was founded a year or two later. Kite came out of stealth about a year later. Uh, in fact, I was just talking with Angela Shen, who wrote, I think, the first clinical trial and in industry for CAR T cells. And the time it took Carl to get to where CAR T cell technology was when we did the deal, and then looking the last 10 years, the progress that we've made. And interestingly, it's been a wonderful new therapeutic modality for certain patients, as, as many in the audience and certainly this panel know. Um, but the progress has been, I would argue, a little bit slower than I expected at the time. Um, when you think about the obstacles that were present at the time, which were basically scalability, safety, and ability to treat solid tumors, those three obstacles still remain, at least for CAR T cells. I mean, we, we sort of started to solve scalability, perhaps, with allogeneic CAR T cells, but the durability of that uh, and the safety continues to be a bit of a question mark. The solid tumor question hasn't been solved, and the safety, at least with CAR T cells, maybe NK cells will fix that hasn't been solved. So um, I think that the question now is, what do we do next in that, in that space? Um, maybe other type of modalities will be part of the answer. I was very intrigued, as I'm sure many were, with NK cell, the first uh, CART NK data that was reported about a week ago from Encarta, very early preliminary data, but as good as preliminary data can be. Uh, so that's a really interesting approach. And, I'm not here to talk about Rubio specifically, but we've taken a totally different approach to try to use uh, a totally different type of cell, in our case, red cells, and engineer them as a new type of cellular therapy, although you can argue it's not really cellular therapy because red cells are questionable whether they're cells or not. <laughs> um, they don't have a nucleus, they don't divide, they don't express MHC, so it's, it's highly questionable. But anyway, it's a totally different approach. I think when it comes to gene therapy, and I'll, I'll keep my comments short, um, 
for me, the question, and I was involved in gene therapy through, uh, as a board member at CRISPR for about 45 years, and one of the key questions at that time, which I think that team did very well, was indication selection, right? You know, to prove the concept, we went until they went after was key, which was ex vivo uh, indication selection, and specifically not try to knock in a gene, but, but quite the opposite. And I think that allowed for very early proof of concept. But I continue to be puzzled by indication selection by gen some gene therapy companies. And when I joined Rubio's, one of the uh, programs that was ongoing at the time, and we terminated since then, was phenylketonuria, which is a disease that is certainly uh, extraordinarily challenging for families, but it's not a life-threatening disease. And, and I continue to be puzzled about gene therapy companies going after diseases like phenylketonuria, where the safety bar is so high um, that any draw any setback in early development can potentially set you back many, many years. Um, and, and these are diseases that can be fundamentally controlled with existing therapies. I think the appeal of one undone is, is certainly there, but we know very well today that in most cases that may not turn out to be that way, at least in the existing AAV-driven gene therapies. So um, I, I'm sure we're going to spend more time about this. Uh, when it comes to gene therapy, I think indication selection for, for early development companies is going to be key. And I would actually shift a little bit away whether in most of these cases we truly will need any time soon gene therapies or new medicines, new programmable medicines, new type of RNA technologies are going to be so fundamentally better than the standard of care that the introduction of gene therapy may be a long time coming. So two great segue here. One, obviously for you, Christian, it was perfect, uh, you know, kind of order here on uh, cell therapy and, you know, liquid tumor versus solid tumor and where m might we be on, on both. And then another segue we'll cover as a panel, which is a range of indication and, you know, what kind of subset of diseases are we talking about? And at one point we'll talk about whether we're going to dare to go after not so rare diseases with gain of function modality, which is more for the end of the panel. So. Kristen, take it away. Overall landscape and then following up on what Pablo said. Sure. Well, <clears throat> I'm a big fan of cell therapy for serious diseases, including cancer. And I had the good fortune, actually, of starting my career as a postdoc. You know, when you're so young, you don't know what's not possible. Working at a small biotech company and leading the first human trials of CAR T cells in HIV infection and solid tumors. And that was in the early 90s. Most people forget that phase of cell therapy because we were iterating and we didn't have the great success that started to come along a decade later. But then I also had the good fortune of being at a company where we could get back into the field of CAR T cell therapy as it was beginning to take off around 2010, 2012 and you know led the partnership with Bluebird that led to the selection of BCMA as a great target for CAR T cells and then the development of IDACEL, now ABECMA, from target selection through preclinical, through all of human development to approval last year. So, you know, I'm a, a fan of cell therapy. I've been at it a long time. And now at BMS, we, of course, have the good fortune of having two approved CAR T cell products against two different targets, BCMA and CD19, in two different blood cancers, myeloma and lymphoma. And, but then you ask, well, what's next you know, in cell therapy? And how do we bring the great um, <clears throat> breakthrough results that we've seen in blood cancers to solid tumors? And, and that is the next nut to crack. And in solid tumors, I say it's the targets. The targets aren't as straightforward in solid tumors. There aren't as many good surface expressed targets that are not also expressed on critical normal tissues. It's trafficking. You know, solid tumors are solid and the CAR T cells need to traffic through the blood and then penetrate the solid tumors. And tumors have engineered all kinds of ways to keep the immune effector cells out. And then if they do get into the tumor, then you have to tackle the immune inhibitory um, microenvironment of the solid tumors. But all of those things are um, areas where this field is really diving in. Uh, we at BMS have a lot of next generation strategies looking for novel targets, mainly through T cell receptors, not through cars, um, tackling the trafficking problem, tackling the immune inhibitory microenvironment problem to try to engineer T cells and other immune effector cells to treat solid tumors. And then there's the critique, well, gosh, autologous cell therapies, that's complicated. You have to make the product from each individual patient. It takes time. It's expensive. 
you know, we have a two-pronged approach there where we plan to optimize autologous cell therapy. I always say, look, if you're going to bet on the biologists or the engineers, I'll bet on the engineers, because engineering, automation, Agreed. these are solvable <laughs> problems. You know, the immune inhibitory microenvironment of a heterogeneous tumor, that's complicated. Um, so autologous cell therapy optimization, and then, you know, this new wave of off-the-shelf allogeneic therapies, and in particular, using iPSC cells <clears throat> to do the gene editing in something that's much more like a traditional biologic master cell bank, and then differentiating it ex vivo into the effector cell of choice. Um, so we have a number of partnerships with innovative small companies along with our internal discovery programs to optimize both areas, the optimal autologous cell therapies and then optimal off-the-shelf allogeneic iPSC-derived cell therapies. How about uh, gene therapy, gene editing, just a, you know, more general view. I know you're spending most of your time in cell therapy, but just some... Yeah, so, so of course, we are now applying the new modalities of gene editing, like CRISPR-based gene editing and AAV, for the next generation of cell therapies. You know, you're knocking out parts of the genome that might make that cell immunogenic. You're knocking in the features into the cell that you want. That's even more pertinent if you're talking about an allogeneic cell, where you don't want that cell to be rejected by the immune system, nor do you want the T cell receptor in that cell to cause graft-versus-host disease in the patient. So there's a lot of gene edits required in the next generation of cell therapies um, that are sort of building off this early success of CAR T cells. Of course, there's, you know, gene editing applies to many other areas. I am on the board of Graphite Bio as an independent board member, you know, which is one of several companies gene editing hematopoietic stem cells to treat hemoglobinopathies like sickle cell disease. So the applications for gene editing in human disease now just seems like an incredible potential. Um, not a, you know, cell therapy and CAR T cells and TCR modified T cells are a focus of ours at BMS. Gene editing, especially for non-malignant disease, um, is, you know, a, a huge area that I think some of our other panelists are focusing on. So, Andy, now you, you know, let's talk about you're looking at it at the enterprise-wide level, you know, both short-term, mid, long-term strategy. Tell us a little bit about the, the trade-offs, the choices, the alloc resource allocation, time planning. Sure. So it's great to be here. I, I'm sensing a gradient on this panel from, <laughs> from cell to cell and gene to gene. So we, I don't know that we set it up that way. You know, we're, we're, we're very organized. It's, and I'm, I'm just reflecting, Pablo, on your comment about the red blood cell not being really a cell. We have to go back 100 years and rewrite textbooks. The red blood not really a cell. <laughs> I don't know how that works for hematologists. <laughs> I can tell you that for European regulatory authorities, it's not a cell. It's not a cell. Interesting. Okay. For whatever it's worth. But anyway. <laughs> well, I, you know, needless to say, I too am very excited by this space. I think that had we not been excited, and I not personally been excited about cell and gene therapies, I don't think I would have served this panel very well. Um, I, you know, I think, you know, what, what we do is magical when we make new medicines for patients. and. You know, the, whether it's a small molecule, whether it's a recombinant protein, or whether it's an advanced technology like a cellar gene, it's always hard. And what I feel most compelled about in this evolving space of advanced technologies is, are the signals that we've seen up until now, the transformative signals. I was really impressed with what Novartis and, and UPenn had done and what Juno had done early on. And those are really the first step into opening up what I think is going to be a future that's going to be replete in oncology and cell therapy. And likewise, in, um, in rare diseases, you have such a match. You have diseases that are defined by a monogenetic etiology that lend themselves so well to a very simple mindset of, of therapy, which is just go in and replace the gene. Now, of course, it's not so simple. There are engineering challenges, there are biology challenges, but what compels me the most in terms of what we've seen so far are those it lead, that leading edge of examples that tells us that we can not only treat disease, but we really have the potential to, to cure diseases. And from our perspective, we're the largest rare diseases company 
um, in the world, very committed to rare diseases. 100% of what we are doing in our labs and through our partnerships in rare disease, 100% is focused on gene therapy. We can unpack a bit the technologies that we're focusing on and how we're approaching that. Um, and then in oncology, um, we're, we're, not, we're actually one of the rare oncology companies that doesn't lead with the PD-1 inhibitor. Right? And I don't know if this is a good decision or not, but we've made the decision <laughs> to focus on other areas of the immune system. And of course, that's not simple either. But our focus has really been on, on innate immunology, so going after innate immune cells. And Pablo mentioned the NK cell. And the other one that we focus on is the gamma delta T cell. So we're taking an orthogonal approach, actually, in trying to build out capabilities that will allow us, we think, to get into solid tumors as well. How about uh, gene editing? Yeah, so I mean, I'm, you know, I'm a clinical geneticist by training. My clinical subspecialty was in clinical genetics, which 30 years ago, when I did this, we couldn't do anything. We would look at a, a patient and try to guess what the patient had just by looking. That sounds really technical. Um, but I think today, with, with gain of function you know, approaches and with gene editing, we're going to change the whole, the whole way we think about this. We haven't really dived into uh, gene editing qu quite as much as some other companies. We, of course, use it in the way that Kristen um, um, articulated to, to, to in, help to engineer our approaches. But we haven't gone in so much in thinking about gene editing as a direct therapeutic. That will happen. We've been a little bit of a laggard in that space. I think it's quite exciting what technology plays out, overcoming the safety risks. And then a theme I'm sure we'll touch on that I find the most challenging in this space is tissue delivery. So how do we ensure that we're delivering whatever it is? In this case, it's a, a gene editing enzyme and a, and a guide RNA. How do we ensure that that's being delivered by tissue? Because I think that's going to have very significant implications on the benefit risk index. OK. So we'll, we'll definitely come back to that. So uh, Catherine, maybe two uh, part to uh, question, the question to you. One, wearing your hat of Amgen Regeneron, your board experience, looking at the space, what's exciting, what's maybe less exciting or less timely or, or is not ready. And then, of course, talk a little bit about gene editing and what you're doing and where it fits in, in the current concept or paradigm of gene editing. Yeah, so uh, maybe I'll start by saying it's hard not to be excited working in drug development right now. When I think about when I started my career in pharma, uh, uh, antibodies were novel and exciting, and not everybody could do them. And now, you know, they they seem um, you know, kind of bread and butter. Um, and I I think what's allowed that to happen um, in part is. Um, all of the incredibly exciting work that's been done in, in academics and in, um, in small biotech that's allowed just enormous number of platforms to begun to be built. Um, and what that's allowed is newer companies to come along with new ideas and leverage off of a lot of the te technologic work that's been done by earlier companies. And so we're in this space where you, know, you feel like a kid in a candy shop when you look and and, and see what's available to uh, leverage for patients in cell and gene therapy, um, including, uh, including gene editing. And as um, Andy said, you, know, you, you get really excited about being able to address, for example, uh, monogenetic diseases with gene editing, something we couldn't have imagined doing 10 or 15 years ago. Um, but what it's opening the door to is even more complex diseases. Uh, diseases where multiple edits end up being important, and you see that in, in cell therapy, for example, as you're um, making uh, allogeneic um, cells that, uh, that ultimately we be, will be able to address a much broader patient population than the current technology, expanding their use into um, a, wide, a much wider range of, of hospitals. Um, and I, I think we're seeing this in, in gene editing, where um, the initial editing approaches have been in uh, monogenetic diseases, primarily silencing. But now there's the opportunity to do gene replacement, um, which uh, opens up an enormous number of doors. Um, at Chroma Medicine, we are developing epigenetic editing-based therapeutics, which I think is going to open up an even larger number of doors, allowing us to silence or activate or do complex mul uh, multiplexing using a single platform. 
and doing this leveraging an endogenous system that we know is highly evolved and allows our cells to remain hepatocytes for our, our lifetime, so a, a durable therapy. But it's been the work that's been done in, um, in cell and gene therapy, again, in building um, technology, which is, I think, accelerating the development process and allowing it to take less time than one might have expected uh, early on in cell therapy. I think we are going to be turning over cards more and more quickly. And there's, as we'll talk about, many hurdles to do that. Um, but I think as a, a community, if we come together, um, we will be able to bring a, a much wider and interesting array of therapeutics to patients where patients will no longer have to define themselves by a particular disease that they may have. So let's, uh, let's go to the next layer, so the, the challenges maybe. So approvability, we can talk about CMC, but maybe, Kristen, we can talk about, uh, we touch on it. In liquid tumor, we've done pretty well so far, lots left to be done. But what are the challenges for solid tumor and the next technology wave? So let's say multiplexed, edited, IPSC-based, yep. you know, and, and so let's talk roughly about the timelines. Uh, and, and because you look at CAR-T, lots of challenges, some of them have been overcome. We have some approval now, so maybe that's a roadmap. Or you look at AAV. AAV took many, many years to get to an approvable platform, right? So you have succession, successive companies that worked and invested a lot of money to get it to a point where the platform itself was approvable. And there was almost an untold oligopoly of scientists and companies that created those standards that essentially ended up being uh, supported by FDA and it became approvable. So what is the roadmap? Are we using some of those in, in the, your respective companies? Yeah, I do. I am optimistic that the success that we've had to date in blood cancers can be iterated and advanced in solid tumors faster. If you just look at the sheer number of intelligent people, scientists, physicians, investors, biotechs, pharmas, that are employing that mind space to solve the tumors right now, I think we will solve the problems. You know, I talked about it before, the first is the targets. You know, CAR targets against surface expressed proteins that are not on critical normal tissues are hard to find in solid tumors. You can live without your B cells and you can live without your plasma cells, but you know, you can't target your lung or your heart or your brain. Um, so even brain, even brain? <laughs> yeah, well maybe some of us could live without our brains, but. Um, you know, so obviously that takes a new strategy to look at intracellular targets that are more differentially expressed. And that's what we're doing through identifying TCRs that recognize HLA presented antigens that are more clearly restricted to the solid tumors. For example, the oncofetal antigens that are in fetuses and in cancers, but not in any other normal tissues. So we have a, a collaboration with the Maddox identifying novel TCR candidates to then engineer into TCR-modified T-cells as opposed to CAR-modified T-cells. So targets is one. You know, trafficking is the second. You, those, those engineered T-cells need to be infused. They need to penetrate the solid tumors. I mean, we know from the field of checkpoint inhibitors that you have immune-infiltrated tumors, you have immune-excluded tumors where the T-cells are piling up at the periphery, and you have immune desert tumors where there's no T-cells at all. And there are active modalities and features of the cancers that are keeping the immune cells out, we can engineer to tackle those strategies into the engineered cells such that they can now traffic and penetrate the tumor. Then you have the immune inhibitory microenvironment, some bad cytokines like TGF-beta. You want good cytokines that are going to amplify that immune response. You can engineer those features into your cells. So I, I think and, and groups, ourselves included, our partners, we have five different you know, cell therapy partnerships, are all looking at these strategies to bring the power of cell therapy to solid tumors. Uh, you also have the effector cell type. You talked about gamma delta T cells, right? You got the alpha beta T cells, you got the gamma delta T cells, you got NK cells. You have groups that are trying to engineer macrophages to eat tumor. Um, so I think between the different effector cell types, between all the engineering opportunities, and then sort of this future where you can get all those edits into an iPSC cell and differentiate it into the effector cell of choice, maybe different effector cells for different settings, 
you know, that, that becomes then the future, I think, of cell therapy for solid tumors. Quick follow-up question, and then we'll, we'll bring it to the entire panel, but uh, autologous CAR-T, so would you say that it's a temporary modality? I don't think so. Um, you know, as I, I said before, do you bet on the biologists or the engineers? I would bet on both, but I would have a little more confidence in the engineers because those problems are so tractable. You know, you need to build robots. You need to automate the systems. I mean, we have already moved from our first generation manufacturing process that, just call it generation one, to what we call next T, which is generation two, which is shortening the process, optimizing the phenotype of the final product for a more durable functional persistence, because we know what phenotype drives the properties that we're seeking. I mean, we've treated over 1,800 patients with our two approved CAR-T products. There's a lot of translational data that can inform what makes a good cell therapy product with the right product attributes to deliver the right durability of response in the clinic. So you can optimize autologous cell manufacture. We've heard from a few companies. Penn just had a beautiful paper in animals still, but showing you know, how you can get rid of the activation step and, and, and mod genetically modify your cells in a one-day process. So I think autologous cell manufacturing is going to rapidly iterate and become more cost effective, simpler, faster. We can then produce it at higher capacity, deliver it to more patients. Marcella said, we don't want to develop cell therapies for mice and wealthy patients. No, we want cell therapies for everybody. And I think that engineering automation aspect of cell therapy informed by deep translational science can get us there in parallel with you know, the huge ongoing investment and can we just create an off-the-shelf cell. So I see Pablo uh, kind of uh, you know, shifting a little bit on his <laughs> oh, chair. No. And, uh, you know, <laughs> so any, any, co any comments there? Uh, sure, let me, before I make the two comments I'm gonna make, um, I, for those that don't know me, I'm, I'm an optimist. I, I believe fundamental belief in the in iteration and innovation and the ability of those processes to solve a lot of these problems. I just think that some of the problems, and, and I agree with Christian actually, some of the problems we're trying to solve might be harder than others. Um, you know, the, to solve away the allogeneic nature of a cell, it's harder than it sounds. I mean, MHC is extraordinarily well conserved. I mean, it's 450 million years of evolution. I mean, sea urchins have MHC. I mean, it, we're trying to make something that has been there forever go away. And that's, you know, it sounds easy. Oh, we're going to edit it out and it's done. The problem is fixed. I'm not sure it will be. And we're just talking about CAR T cells here or, or cell therapies for cancer, but serotherapies in a range of other indications like diabetes, et cetera, I think are going to be even more complicated. Um, so that's the, that's the only reaction. I was just thinking about what Christian was saying. I actually agree. I, now, the solid tumor question, I think there, it's not that I disagree, I just, so let's take a step back. What's the best cellular therapy today for solid tumors? It's TILS, right? I mean, it doesn't work great and it's probably not scalable, but it's the, be the best result is in a cellular therapy for solid tumors today come from TILS. And why? Probably because we let the immune system pick the targets because we don't try to tell the immune system where to go and lymphoma myeloma are very unique diseases um, in this case, we just take the cells, expand them, give the patient IL-2, and we let the immune system do the job they've been doing for hundreds of millions of years. I, I'm not going to advocate here that that's the only way to do it, and I think we need to continue to figure this out. I'm a little bit more skeptical about, in the medium term, five, ten years, to be able to solve the solid tumor questions with, uh, with T cell therapies, engineered T cell therapies. I'm a little bit more skeptical. Okay. Hopefully I'm wrong. I mean, I'm an oncologist by training, so hopefully I'm wrong. So it's a great segue for back to you, Andy, and, you know, uh, now trying to kind of corner you a little bit more on the gene editing and the next gen and how do you time the successive, you know, modalities and, and how do you think about investment and resource allocation, right? Because it'd be, it'd be easy to crowd out kind of potentially new development, even though I know you have a big budget, but uh, even then, it would be easy to crowd out some potential new development because there is so many exciting things that are happening now that might be on a path to approvability 
I know you've been active in cell therapy, you've been active in AAV, but so how do you time and how do you titrate the investment and the BD activity in the next gen, right? And to take a very simple example, and maybe it's a, it's a bit of a dreamland, but you know, AAV is obviously replacing gene, right, roughly. I mean, it's very simplistic, but that's what it is. It's a classic, it's the original gain of function modality. If we, in fact, can replace the gene through gene editing, whether it's insertion or whether it's HDR, right? I mean, now we're going to be able to do that without double-stranded break. You could argue that maybe safety might be less of a concern. There is a lot of technical challenge, but those modalities are extraordinarily attractive. If you could actually do permanent gain of function with something that is not more challenging than, than AAV and, in fact, might be more permanent, when is the right time to start, you know, investing and testing? Yeah. Well, we have nine and a half minutes left, and I'll only take a couple minutes, so it's a hard <laughs> answer. It's a hard answer to do even in nine minutes. Yeah. But I have to reflect on the privileged cohort that you defined of mice and wealthy patients. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I have to remember that, um, Kristen. But, you know, I mean, I'm, I, so, uh, so our budget is big, but it doesn't matter how big your budget is. But what we do is really hard and really expensive, and you need to make choices and prioritize. And, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we've made the decision that in our rare genetics and hematology group, 100% of what we do is in gene therapy. That still leaves a, a lot open. And in oncology, everything is focused on innate immunity with about half of it in cell therapy. So we've made some choices, but even within those big buckets, there's a lot that we can be doing. And so our model is you know, taking advantage of or enabling or partnering with great companies like Catherine's company. And so we've created a and we've learned what works and what doesn't work. And a lot of what we've done in terms of our partnering has not worked. But a lot of the creativity like you're suggesting or the ideas that Catherine's company worked on, we can't do that in-house. It, we don't do well with that iterative, exploratory innovation. So what we try to do is we try to build the fundamental core capabilities, CMC, bioprocess, you know, fill in the blanks. And then we work radially to bring in the biology, and, and so some of that biology will apoptose. It won't make it. And so that, it's easier to separate from a, from a biological paradigm or a platform if you don't own it as a large company. And so that's kind of been our model. So it allows us to explore, and then when, when a technology looks like it's starting to inflect, start to really deeply invest. And you know, the last comment I'll make is that, and we talked about this, you know, given the nature of our investment and our predictions as to what will be relevant in the next five to 10 years, we imagine that about 50%, 50, 50 5 of our clinical stage pipeline in seven to 10 years will be in cell and gene therapy. I'll, I'll, give, I'll leave a few minutes for uh, Catherine, but I can't let you off the hook quite yet. Uh, the, uh, so, so what does it mean in terms of, uh, let's say, just partnering? So what is, when is the right time to say that you're going to uh, do a strategic partnership or even an acquisition in the next gen modality, forget which one it is, but it's like the next generation. It's, a, it's early, but presumably there is animal data. Let's, let's start there. So you've got animal data. Uh, the molecular biology clearly works. People have figured out the system. Um, they're presumably, let's take an example, they're on the path to, uh, to an IND. They have their first uh, you know, development candidate. Uh, are you starting to really engage and maybe not do a transaction, but at least kind of rebuild the relationship then? Or do you, by definition, wait for 1A, maybe 1B data uh, to have at least some sense of the behavior of the system in humans? Yeah. Well, this is a great answer, all of the above. I mean, Chris, <laughs> okay. Kristen can talk about the experience with Juno and Celgene and BMS, and you know, there's a large price tag, but you're getting a lot of advanced technology. Our, our strategy, though, has not been that for many reasons. We like to go in really early. And we have many examples, Gamma Delta Therapeutics, Maverick, which is a bi-specific company that I know Pablo knows quite well, um, and others, where, where we engage very early and allows us to do a couple of things. First and foremost is culture. You scientists don't like to just buy. They like to be involved. And the, when you create the right kind of environment, the synergies that can exist between scientists in larger companies such as mine and biotech is, can be phenomenal. 
And then the second is that we start to en engage in, you know, with Maverick, for example, this bi-specific platform, as we were engaging, we realized that they didn't have the capabilities to build cell lines, to manufacture these complex um, bi-specifics. And so we went in, provided some capability that they didn't have, and the two of our companies came together in a really brilliant way. Now, the drawback is that your, the motivations sometimes and the incentives are different for the large company and the small company. Uh, very quickly, Gamma Delta Therapeutics, we co-founded, we co-started with Adrian Heyday, the, the academic founder, and Abingworth. So it was a build to buy right from the beginning. Great partnership, great collaboration, but at a certain point, they didn't know if we would, they, we did the build, they didn't know if we were gonna do the buy. So they started bringing in a chief business officer and they started down a path that wasn't that interesting to us building programs that we didn't think had a path forward, but that would create some buzz and some value for the company. And so at that point, we had to make a decision. Are we excited about this? And we decided that we were, and we stepped in about a year, year and a half early to execute our, the buy. So you have to be flexible along the way because the science evolves, but so does the environment and so do the motivations. You clearly wanted to buy before they were successful in raising the price too much. Well, that, the buy, but the build to buy benefit is, I know, I know, I know okay. <laughs> you VC guys, you're always thinking about money. It's, it's only a joke. I mean, so, Cass, when you, you're, so maybe let's look at it now from the company standpoint, right? You're competing in the space. You're competing with loss of function company because you can obviously downregulate or gain a function company. How do you look at it, which is a slightly different perspective than, you know, Andy and Kristen. Uh, because you're one of the competitors trying to kind of uh, attract the spotlights. Uh, how do you look at the competition right now in the gene editing field, right? And uh, uh, in general, and how does it influence? Obviously, indication selection, as we said, is massive, right? And I don't know if you're kind of ready to comment on that, but, but tell us a little bit of the key to competitive behavior as a company in the gene editing space. I, I think it's... Um as we have more tools that become available to us, we can start selecting the tool that's right for the particular job you're trying to accomplish. And um, I think to date in with gene editing, um, that was the one and done approach for silencing. And so we were using and are still using gene editing to regulate gene expression. But as more technologies like our technology becomes available, um, you can leverage a technology that was, um, that was evolved to regulate gene expression. And so you start to see uh, therapeutics, I think, over time starting to move into um, spaces that they are most appropriate, the most appropriate tool for. So gene editing, for example, it's a, a, uh, probably the, the, at least today, the only path forward I think that we can see to have a one and done gene correction um, therapeutic. And so that's a phenomenal space for gene editing. Um, it's a complicated space, the payloads are bigger, what the machinery is doing is more complex. Um, and so there's more um, technology and biology to unlock, but it's a path forward for uh, for genes that are not um, amenable to either gene activation or gene silencing. Um, I think we'll see this more and more as, as technologies continue to advance, um, that we just simply have a larger toolkit that we can select from and, um, and we'll build our therapeutics uh, accordingly. Okay, well, uh, so Chris, I think I don't know if I press the wrong button because I, I haven't got any question here, but. <laughs> I think I'm still on the right page, so I mean, <laughs> technically. So I'm, we're going to give you a, a, a minute and a half back. So I'd like to thank our panelists, and uh, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Thank you.